good afternoon ladies and gentlemen my name is sipo kiha i am going to be steering the ship the ship this afternoon we here to celebrate the life of a young lady who was not only beautiful but witty super intelligent never spoke with a forked tongue was very honest one could speak until they run out of superlatives to describe na lady but i will allow the speakers to tell you more about na lady i just want to remind everyone and also welcome the viewers that are watching across the different streaming platforms that we are streaming this service live and the hashtag that we are using for this memorial service is naledi willers memorial hashtag naledi willers memorial so that's the hashtag that we are using for the memorial service at this moment i'm going to ask pastor nonofo mutwagai to come and open for us with a word of prayer and then we will resume the program let us pray now heavenly father what in heaven we come before your throne of grace in the office of prayer at this hour lord we are hard broken death disrespects humanity at all times but we thank you for the guarantee that you are still sitting on your throne and you're watching over us it is my prayer that you pour your holy spirit upon us it's my prayer that you comfort the family and the friends and the community at large it is never easy to bury anyone no matter the some circumstances but we solicit for your presence in this program we ask that your holy spirit may fall afresh on us that's our prayer in jesus name amen thank you very much uh, fundisi i'm going to ask snare global to come and render an item of music for us snare over to you <laughs>
I'm ready to join the military now because I've learned how to suffer in silence. I also believe that if you beat me continuously, I will keep state secrets. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Um, I've been sent to do some blood tests for my oncologist and for Vitalab. I eventually shifted into a gear called Dying Inside. I never go to the hospital because I know her. I'll be taking some of her pains. I was obsessed with what did I do? Like, what did I do that made me get it? And <laughs> don't say, oh, you're going to make me cry. I'm able to hear what she's not saying. We sort of, we would go through the banter and just sort of like meander without being deliberate about it to just into just maybe discussing nuances of, around what's going on with her. After thinking I might die, and then thought, oh shit, my mother's going to panic and probably die before I can survive. Good morning. Good morning. I'm fine, thank you. Are you ready to start? A bit nervous, yes. No, don't. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Do you have any questions you want to ask me? I've spent some time with an lady before this, so we've gone through quite a few things, but I don't know if you have anything you want to know or... It's not that much, really. I'm just here to support my daughter. Mm -hmm. I love her very much. <laughs> what were your fears? What, what were your concerns? Can my eyes just answer and I don't have to say anything? The other thing what I wanted to say is, well, you, you are a fighter, okay? You did extremely well. I mean, you might look back on this and I'm gone, and then you're like, ha ha ha, but... I'm part of the fight together, I can't get yes, my girl. The big reveal. That's <laughs> cute. Ah, boozy. It's tough. Oh. She's gonna make me cry now. And I'm hanging in there. No, come, it's here. I know. Anybody is casting any aliens in any movies. I'm just saying. I've also got cancer, so consider that. Like, make a wish, what, what, that thing. Just in case I don't make it. I feel a horror. It's one of those things, smoke so long, sit in the and I it's a horror. At the end of the day, so I have to realize that I'm in a tight spot. What a journey! What a journey it has been. Just to check quickly, is uh, Bubs already here? Bubs and Honey, could you please? Come forward and share with us your experiences with Naledi. Over to you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Baba Lamneno, and I'm with my niece, Honey. Today, she forced to come here. She was like, Auntie B, there's no ways. I'm not going to say my last goodbye to Auntie Nalevi. I'm so annoyed that I'm the one that's breaking down before Honey even speaks. So Honey will speak before I do. Um, honey, hear my love. Be strong. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to tell everyone how Aunt Nelly treated me so nicely. She taught me how to knit. She bought me wool and knitting pins. And every day I would ask her, please help me to knit. And to no longer see her face breaks me every day. So suddenly, you were taken that I couldn't even say bye or say I love you. And tell that you were in my life. The hurt I felt when she passed cut me like a knife. I'll never forget Auntie Naledi. She was like my own mom. And she even gave me a nickname, Spaghetti. I loved her so much and may her soul rest in peace. And I just wanted to tell small granny something. We love you so much. Your loss is our loss. Sending so much love. Thank you. not good at fitting things in. <laughs> so I also wrote a little something and that is because from the moment I heard about my friend's passing, I've literally had nothing to say. I've heard no words. I've had nothing to write, I've had no caption, I've heard absolutely nothing, I've just been numb. And it so happened that she left on the day I was also still grieving for a boss of mine who was also a big brother to me and my family's support in every single way. So uh, the two griefs just, you know, got me so numb and I was also very fortunate to spend Naledi's last years because I'm sure a lot of people spent like her previous or younger years and enjoyed that time with her. I enjoyed the last few years. <sighs> what breaks me more is that she fought, she fought so hard the first bout, I believed that that was it. We'll never go back to that pain that she went through again. And we were together, both occasions. The first occasion when she had to fight for the first time, I was with her. When the doctor called her in to tell her she needs to fly back from wherever she is, so she could get another scan because she's kind of sensing there's something else that she's noticing in her blood cells. I was with her. But I encouraged her, I told her. But it's, I guess it must have been hard because I wasn't going through what she was going through, but I tried to instill some positivity in her. And I just told her, just be strong. God will never take you away from us. You are such a beautiful spirit. You are so strong. God does not take strong people. So just think positive. And that's just one thing we always bantered about. We fought about that. Because Naledi never liked speaking positively about herself. She was very good at doing that with other people. But when it comes to her, she didn't see what we saw in her. 
So today, because of my numbness and how I feel, I decided to write a little letter for my beautiful, intelligent, outspoken, free-spirited, soft life loving friend of mine. Na legend, na li soft life. Your life was a true blessing to me and my whole entire family. When you came to me and told me you needed a big sister in your life, at that stage we did not even know what was going on with you. She didn't know either. But I told her, Na lady, I'm your big sister. I have a big family. If you want to join the family, you're more than welcome. Na lady did not hesitate to move in with my family. And then we got the bad news. We got small granny, as the kids affectionately call Na lady's mom, because my mom is the bigger granny because she's older. We spent a beautiful time with Na lady. Na lady was such a beautiful human to my nieces and nephews. She helped me do the things that I couldn't do. She was a disciplinarian. She taught the kids how to do their homework on time and then play and then go, get on their phones like she was what I wasn't. And I would have never asked for anything more. I worked at night. So during the day, I have no time to check homework or spend time with the kids because I have to rest and get up and go to work again. Naledi did all of that for me and my family. She had bonding sessions with my mom in the kitchen, something I didn't have. I'm good at speaking with everyone via text. I'm not a talkative person. I'm not someone that likes being in people's company. So she did almost everything that I couldn't do for my family. So I understand why Honey wanted to be here. I was in Nigeria when Honey sent me a text on Snapchat. Auntie B, when you come back, make sure you take me with. I need to say something to Auntie the Lady. So today I made sure that she was here with me. So it breaks my heart to have to sit here and watch small granny go through what she's going through because Na Lady was her only child. At least if anything happens to any of us in my family, my mom has three other kids to look out for. But small granny, you need to know Na Lady loved you. Na Lady will never leave your side. Physically she might have, but emotionally she will look over you. The rain, the wind, the clouds, the sun, anything around you, Naledi will present herself. When you feel down or in the dark, you need comfort, Naledi will hold your hand and tell you, Mama, you gave me breath. Now it's my time to make sure that you live your life because I'm watching over you. I am your angel now. For me, I've lost a true warrior. I put it out on Instagram just the other day. No one fights my battles like the lady did. I would even tell her, friend, you don't have to. These people will never stop saying what they feel like saying. But I understand because you know me, you feel like you need to say something. And from that point, I could never stop her. If anyone even just sniffs anything negative about me, the lady would get on her phone and tell them where to get off. I have lost my true warrior. I have lost a soldier on my side. I have lost my travel partner. I was the lady's everything. Her big sister, her mom, because I'm sure I'm close to her mom's age. But... I also made sure we have the best of times. It's, it's going to be very hard to fill her space. Na lady left so much brightness within myself and my family. No darkness can dull it. Small granny, we love you so much. Please do remember that the Nano family 
will always be your family. I mean, there's nothing I can say that can fix this, but just know that we are around and we are here for you. Thank you guys, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to Bob's. There are many lessons that could be drawn from the life of, of Naledi. And I can sense that the mood is, is somber and understandably so. But if we look back and think to the memories that we have shared with Naledi, there were so many moments that we could look back at, laugh, cry, learn lessons, and so forth. I'm not one of the speakers, but I would just like to share something with you quickly. Soon after Naledi was introduced to me, the very first ever voice note that she sent to me, and this is before we had, we had met each other. I did not incorporate this into the whole tech setup and the AV setup, so I'm just going to play it for you from the phone. Hi, Bo. See, Bo. 90 kilos, Kanti. Are you a giant? <laughs> I'm just asking, sorry. Like, you could be a bodybuilder. Who knows? I'm just shocked. Anyway, I'm forwarding. This is not for me to judge. Yeah. So, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, I am nothing close to uh, being a bodybuilder. But that was the funny side of uh, Naledi, and I'm sure each of us have our own different experiences of Naledi in the various aspects that we had grown to know her, to know her in. Um, at this point, I'm going to, to ask Sophia to bless us with uh, an item of music, after which I would like Sonia to, to get ready. She will be our next speaker. Sophia, over to you. Oh, 
It's okay to, to clap even harder. We, we don't need to have a social distancing between our hands. Uh, it doesn't fall under the COVID regulation. So please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Sonia, over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, if you know Naledi, you know what music meant to her. Um, she could harmonize like nobody's business. And when, um, when I was roped in and we were having a chat as to who could perform, and for me, Sophia, you know, You've always come to my rescue, and I'm so glad that you're here. And I know that Naledi appreciates it, and I know she was harmonizing with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity, family, mama. Thank you, Dudu, for bringing me in. O'Neill, Sips, thank you so much. Ha! <sighs> Now, Lady Loved Life, so I, I, I know the mood is somber, but I just want us to, to remember the joy that she brought into a room. So um, I'm going to try and represent that joy. I didn't write a speech. I just highlighted the things that I needed to say. If I were to write a book, it would be a book of Na Lady chapters, simply titled Musadi. First chapter, it's 10 chapters. I'm going to take a minute on each, so <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> you're safe. Um, first chapter, the title. It was Mrs. S.A. I was one of the judges. The lady walked in the room. 
My life was never the same again. She walked in that room, she took over. It was top 24, and we needed to eliminate to top 12. And she walked in with the panel of judges. She was like, Dimilang, Maholo. And then she went, ah! <laughs> The songs! <laughs> and I was sold, you know? Um, but she was that type of person. And from then on, it was a serious moment. And she did not only blow me away, but she blew the judges away. However, you know, there's, there's certain people in a room that might not like you, right? And there were a couple <laughs> in that panel, but, you know, didn't see what I saw. Um, it was myself, Onele, and Robert. I remember we were just fighting for her. And she got up to top 19. And I was going to the bathroom. She called me. She was like, what are my chances? And I said, now, lady, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not looking good. She was like, damn, Musadi. <laughs> they don't like me. They don't like this. And I was like, you know what? This may not be your title as the chapter, but you are titled for so many things in life. You are going places. And I'm going to take you on that ride. I said, let's make a pact. We're going to move together. So when I move, you move. When you move, I'll move. But we're moving together. And I had driven to Sun City. I had to call my ex-husband, who sent a driver, just so I could be in the car with my lady driving back. Because from then, I knew I had found a soul sister. I knew I had found a little sister. And in the car, it was as if we had known each other for forever. I can't sing, and she was teaching me how to harmonize. She was like, if we were moving together, I'm going to show we need to be on that stage. I'm Beyonce, of course. <laughs> you can choose between Michelle and Kelly, but just know that I'm Michelle. But we're going, to be, we're going to be on those world stages. The next chapter, the sisterhood. We drove. She drove me to my house, dropped me off. She walked in, greeted the kids as if she was an old auntie. And guys, we never looked back. The sisterhood was formed. Uh, we did everything together, spent almost every day together. And, um, <laughs> you know, she would, she was a jack of all trades in the sisterhood. She would, she would come and cook for you. She was a chef. Like, now, lady, what is, it, what is it that you can't do? You can sing, you can cook, you can bake, you can do all things. And within that sisterhood, it moved from superficial to deep. If ever there was a spirit animal, it would be Naledi Musadi Willis to me. And I remember when I was going through a divorce, she was there for me. When I say there for me, I mean she was there for me. I suffered depression. Obviously, I mean... I'm sure as many of you would imagine, would, would, can imagine, it was a public spectacle. It was a public divorce. It wasn't easy. And with the depression, I would sleep on a Monday and wake up on a Friday. Because I lost days, I lost my sense of self, I lost the meaning of life. And a lady was there to hold my hand and give me that meaning. And a lady would arrange for friends to come in, clean my house, cook for me, drag me out of side of the bed, put me in the, in the shower, cook. She did it all. And I know that I would not have survived that period if she was not in my life. She was a champion, and she championed me through that phase. And for that, Musadi, I thank you. The nicknamer, that's chapter three. <laughs> If you're in a lady's life and you didn't have a nickname, I was still from Sugar, her mom, <laughs> because of her love for chocolate, to Mbuzi, to Musadi, to Skeleton. If you were in, if you were in a lady's life, you would sure, surely have a nickname. And that brought out the humor in her. 
And when things were serious, she would tap into that mode of humor, call you by nickname, tease you, drag you, school you, <laughs> read you, sit you down, and then say, was that a teachable moment, honey? <laughs> um, the inner circle. I started moving with Naledi, not only socially, not only business-wise, not only fun-wise, but just in terms of the people in my life. Brought her into the inner, inner circle. Most people that are here that I, on the Sonia's friendship side, they've all met Naledi through me. From our gay brigades to our sisters, Komoto and Asanda, and Tidi, you know, she moved with everyone. She loved everyone. She, you could never put Naledi in a corner. Naledi would take over the room, would take over the friendships. And that's what I loved about her because she had this no holds barred attitude and, and look, outlook on life. And that's how she became, or became part of the inner circle. The big brain. <laughs> My daughter calls smart people big brains. You know, Naledi and I would laugh because I would tell her what Musa did when she was young. Musa went to kindergarten, I think, at 16 months. By 18 months, Musa would not want to sit in the class with his older brother who went to the same Montessori. And I would tell Naledi this story. Naledi was like, but that's me. Are you shocked? So Musa would come, came home one day, threw her lunchbox at 18 months, and I was like, oh! I'm like, what, baby? She's like, Kumo, tell her. Kumo's like, see, mom, the thing is, Musa, she's like, Kumo, are you going to tell her or not? Kumo's like, Musa, wait. You want me to tell her? I'm going to tell her. Kumo's like, okay, so mom, the thing is, Musa doesn't want... Kumo, tell the story already. Kumo's like, wait, Musa. Musa's like, oh! Kumo's like, okay, you see, mom, Musa does not want to sit in the baby class. Musa's like, tell her why. Musa's like, Kuma's like, wait, I'm telling the story, wait. Musa, Kuma's like, okay, so she doesn't want to sit in the baby class because Musa was like, because they don't speak. <laughs> They're busy with that baby language. <laughs> Nalini was on the floor when I told her that story. So every time we would be frustrated, we were like, ah, it's because they don't speak. Whether they don't speak a language <laughs> socially or otherwise. But my lady was a big brain. We would debate about why there's blood flow in our veins, to why the grass is green, to why she wants a baby daughter, because she would give you the specs of why she wants a daughter and not a son. She would tell you how she was groomed, that little girl, that little girl was going to be the first Miss Universe. That was my lady. Big brain, big plans. Chapter 6, the glamorous couch potato. You know what I mean? She would dress up when we need to go out. She would drip from head to toe. But if Naledi didn't have to dress up, Naledi did not dress up for no one. Onesie every day, all day. We would go to the movies in the onesies. We would sneak our bottle of <clears throat> beverages <laughs> in the movies. <laughs> we would drive to holidays in our onesies. We would go to restaurants in our onesies. She loved glamour. She looked amazing every time she stepped out. But she was a glamorous couch potato. <sighs> the break. Before the break, I want to do the show. So she was going through a lot in her marriage. You know, the, the circle had turned. Roles were reversed. And I was there for Naledi, as she was for me during my divorce. I can't get into the details, but it was not pretty. And I made sure that she comes out of it as pretty as she is, as pretty as she was. And it's tough thinking about those moments, but she made it. And I came up with a solution. I said, Naledi, okay, so this is what we're going to do. Remember, we are moving together. So there's a show that's coming. I'm going to give you the plug. You're going to make it work. And surely, 
he became one of the cast members for Real Housewives of Johannesburg. It was tough finding cast at the time. I mean, do you see Precious Mosebe in Real Housewives, really? But my lady was like, I'll be, I'll be your Precious, you know? So, yeah, man. Then there was the break. People love each other daily. People spend every moment together. And people break up. And our breakup was the most difficult thing I could have gone through. Again, I'm not going to get into details. But every day, thinking about her, I loved her still. And then there was the rekindle, which is chapter 8. I picked up the phone one day. I was like, Masari, I can't. I can't do this. I can't live without you. Let's make it work. And we rekindled the survival mode. When she was sick, I tried to introduce her to stem cells because there's these guys, this couple that I know that work with stem cells. They are in marketing, network marketing. And I tried to get her onto that stuff. And, you know, I think she was frustrated. And that didn't work out because as she picked up the phone and said, okay, make the plug, make the introduction, it was too late. The next chapter, which is the last chapter, and the lady's story is not over. The book continues. The chapters will continue in heaven because the lady's legacy will live on. Mama Bakhumi, thank you. As, thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for your honest input and your truth on your friendship with Naledi. In true Naledi spirit, you spoke with no forked tongue, and you gave us a good account of your friendship with Naledi. Before the tech guys cue the video, on the relationship with music, and this is Naledi's relationship with music. Um, between the vocal part and her love for music. Um, uh, this happened at, at Dudu's house, by the way, in uh, the checkered red and white pink pajamas. Also the same day that she introduced me to uh, Don Julio, 1942. And that is a legacy that she has left me with. So over tequila, we were both harmonizing. So that was beautiful. But man, did she have one of the most terrible music playlists. One of the most incoherent playlists that you could ever listen to when it comes to music. She will play my piano and jump from that and play R&B and then jump from that, play uh, a little bit of Afrobeats, the most incoherent and terrible playlist ever. Now, this is somebody who strongly believed that she had the best I'm a play piano playlist, and she knew all the songs that everybody did not know at the time. So she had the, the, the vocal prowess, she had the voice, she could sing, she could harmonize, but man, she had a terrible music playlist. Um, gentlemen, I think you can, you can cue the video. Uh, Tabo, uh, it will be you after the video, so you can, you can prepare yourself. What's happening? Surprise. <laughs> Three twenty-eight. O'Neill was looking puzzled. He's like, what is happening here? <laughs> that lady is smiling. Kevish. Foreign? Why are you pissed? Because I'm shaking my Yes. Why are we here? We're here to Celebrate a certain tall somebody. <laughs> a, ver a vertically um, gifted. Yes, man. vertically gifted, not vertically shallow. He's done it all. He's been like butcher, baker, candlestick maker, counselor, pastor, mediator between. You. Yeah, literally everything. Sage advice, bartender. So whenever I'd sit and talk to him about my problems, I'd be drinking lizard wine. <laughs> This is Mbamba wine, but it's dope when you got problems. <laughs> it goes in. 
And this year, yeah, so I finished, um, I developed breast cancer, guys. And he was literally my sanity through it all, from near and far. And so I thought, instead of doing a bride, because that's so lazy, like one of you guys were going to cook dry meat and then we're going to sit and drink cheap alcohol and talk rubbish. <laughs> I decided to wake you up at three o'clock. And um, yeah, just as a token of appreciation for my, my alter ego, my male alter ego. So, I'm definitely the worst twin. Yeah, yes. You're the worst twin. But I'm on brand also. I never claimed to be. <laughs> I never claimed to That's be. Papa yes, you know, and he's the same. It's just. It's, but the thing is, I know that we're probably two of the nicest people on earth. We just don't waste too much time campaigning like that. Why? Why are you doing a secret? <laughs> What do you think, sir? You plucked it to take it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tabo Chaka. I was Naledi's uh, cardiopulmonary physiotherapist at the Morningside Medi Clinic. I speak for my team and for the staff at Morningside Medi Clinic that were close to Naledi when we say we are really saddened by her passing. When I met Naledi for the first time, she had her guard up. I think it was because she had dealt with so many medical professionals that were saying horrible things all the time. So when I stepped into the picture, it was like, here's another one. It's going to tell me something I already know. Um, but I saw that she was dealing with a lot of things spiritually and mentally that she didn't want to get into at that point because it took some time before be open with each other. It was only after like four or five sessions that she started relaxing around me to the point that she became open about some of those battles that she was experiencing. I eventually met Mama, the love of her life. And I realized that me and our lady shared something in our characters that became a very strong common ground that we really, really love our mothers. Now, lady would do anything for her mother. And it wasn't something very difficult for me to gravitate to. So as time went on, she would tell me about stuff about her mother and I'd tell her stuff about my mother and then it just became a thing, you know? And then I'd enter into her room and she'd be like, Uri mama. And it would just be her word of saying, what has my mother been saying lately? And then she would go on about what her mother's been saying. And then we would go on like that for hours. As time went on, things started becoming more and more difficult. More doctors came in with worse and worse news. And it got to a point where it started to become a reality that we wouldn't see our 31st birthday. She said to me, Tabo, I was born on a very, very blessed day, 11-11. I don't know what you need to do, but do it in whatever way you need to do it, 
to make sure I see that birthday. I said, now lady, I'll do my best. I'll do my best to make sure that you see that birthday and if possible, many more days after that. So with mama present here, it's witness that I kept that promise. As, as difficult as it may be to stand here, as a medical professional, Naledi made it easy because she was willing to do anything to make sure that she gets one more day, one more hour, one more week. She told me about all her friends, about her family, about people who were close to her, that she wants to share one more birthday with, one more party, one more trip with. And if it means I have to sit here for two hours practicing these breathing exercises to get one more day, I'm going to do it. My lady, my friend, treating you will forever remain an honor of my professional career. Don't worry about mama. Me, O'Neill, Dudu, Uncle T, and Babs will take care of mama. It's your time to rest now, my friend. Rest easy until we meet again. Thank you. Those who know a lady might also know of her generosity. And if you watch the video that just played now, that hot air balloon experience, I think, per individual cost about 3,000 rands, give or take. And when she arranged the experience, she contacted each of us, who are O'Neill's friends. And of course, naturally, we wanted to find out how much the experience would cost. And she said, no, um, don't worry about that. I've already paid for everything. That's the type of person that she was to show her appreciation. And as she says, instead of organizing a braai where someone will bring potato salad, another one will bring beetroot, uh, she took us on that experience at her own cost to show her appreciation for somebody she regarded as an older brother. I'm going to, to ask Sne uh, to come forward and give us an item of music. I know it's a little bit hot uh, in here, ladies and gentlemen. I've already sent through a message to the venue people to try and fix that situation in case you were feeling slightly uncomfortable. Uh, we are almost near the end of our program. Sne? Over to you.
As our tech team choose the next video, the hymn that Snare just played was penned many years ago by an American lawyer, Horatio Spafford, if you know the story. He lost four of his daughters on a transatlantic voyage when the ship that they were in uh, was caught in a wreck. He lost four of his daughters in that wreck. And the song that we know, and that has just been played here, is a direct consequence of the experience that Horatio Spafford went through. In the first stanza of the song, he says, When sorrows like sea, like sin, billows roll. And then he finish by, finishes by saying, whatever my lot thou have, has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I want to say to you, sugar, even though you have lost Nalidi, I hope through this experience you'll be able to walk away from it and still say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You can play the next uh, video, gentlemen. Hey, bro. Serious. Serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Serious. You have to open it, Dad. I want to see what it looks like. Yes. Yes, Mr. Zuma. <laughs> My it's ours. I thought My I'd shit. add to your your T-shirts. Is that so? <laughs> yeah, so you have another Wonderful. one to wear when you're receiving people for tea. Mm. Oh. 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 I think it's very nice. <laughs> That's pretty. Wonderful. Very nice. Now you can change shirts. Wonderful. Yes. Yes, now they'll see that there's. Beautiful. Oh, wonderful. We need to have this. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. He's been shelling the lady, Daddy. You have no difficulties being on a boat. I lose everything. So no. oh, I, I know we questioned him hard. <laughs> <Is that so? laughs> we asked about the kids yeah, and the number of wives. Everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Daddy. 
<laughs> what are you gonna do with that shirt, Daddy? <laughs> I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank everybody of you who are here to come and share this moment with me. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope God, me, God will give me strength and the power to stand here to talk to you all. I am Bahomi Willis. I am the mother of Naledi Willis, the multi talented legend, the one and the only one. Naledi was a she was really very special to me. She was only the one daughter I had. She doesn't have any siblings. Knowledge, as you see in her pictures when she was a baby, when she was a small girl, Knowledge was born a warrior. She grew up alone with me and her father. But whenever we are with Naledi, when she was growing up, she was a little girl who will always be trying to mix up with everything, wanting to learn a lot of things, even the bigger things, which she was not supposed to touch or move around with or mix up with. But she was always wanting to know everything from her small age. When she was five years old, she started her crash, the school for small kids. So we took her to her preschool, and then we left there. Within less than five hours, we were called and told her, Naledi, now she's a teacher at the school. <laughs> and now instead of sitting on her chair, she's crawling around the chairs and she's pulling everybody who's sitting on the chair so that she can start playing and then as she wants to teach them what she wants to play her own games. She grew up like that and uh, she was very clever, very, very clever. She was born an angel. She was born the light of my life. She's been like that since she was a baby, 
and she kept that on until and until. I'm very happy to be standing here in front of you people to come and share these moments with you of my past angel. She'll always be in my heart and nothing will ever take that away. Me and Naledi, we share we shared a very, very, I don't know how can I explain it because I don't know how to say it in English, but I can only say it in Sichuana. Una ali, pur nala ene ne rishwarakhani. Ne rishwarakhani, ha alwala, ki alwala. Ha nal hedeiki, ki nal hedeiki. Lady the day when she was found horing on a kankere, I called from home. In a kamuza hor naledi, are you okay? Abantari, yes, mama, I'm okay. Kwekumara can know you are not. I kept on calling her because whenever asa feel okay, ota abata hore yanu haki bualene o kata the conversation short so that. I cannot connect to her to see exactly what is going on. <laughs> when we started this road of uh, this disease, it was very, very, very difficult for me. I couldn't believe what she told me because she went home. When she got home, she had something like a toolbox. Something like a toolbox, which she came with it, with a lot of medications in it. And then we sat there in her room, and then I say to her, Naledi, what is going on? I didn't even last for two seconds. I cracked. Because I could feel, for right now, what she's bringing to me is something which I will never, ever be able to handle it. She sat me down on her bed, and then she said to me, Mama, and then I say, yeah. She said to me, come and sit next to me. So I came, and then I sat next to her. Like always, she went and brought a big jug of water with her to come and put next to me so that I can keep on drinking a little bit. And then we sit there, and she started talking. Mm. When she told me everything, I was really dead inside. I went completely dead. But then, then she said to me, Mama, you have to be strong. So I listened. We started that trip together. We fought together. We went through everything together. There are some times where she wanted to give up. That was last year. And then I said to her, no, don't give up. You'll get there. And uh, when she grew up, Naledi, she was very afraid of the injections. She was very, very afraid of the injections. Every time we have to take her to the doctor, when she's sick or she needs to receive some injections, maybe traveling through in the country, we'll have to hold her. The dad will hold her, I'll hold her, so that she can get that injection. This time, Naledi, when she went home with this toolbox, which was carrying all the medications, the only reason she took it there was to go and try the first injection with me at home so that we can go through this together so that I can calm her down to a point in her she will be able to continue doing those injections on her own even when I'm not around. <laughs> My daughter, wherever she is right now, I'm sure she's very happy. She really 
taught me something when we were going through this tough time. She taught me a lot of things, and I have learned a lot of things from her, which I didn't, some of them I didn't even think, or I will learn them. At my age, I thought maybe I was past that, but surely I was still coming behind. She's taught me how to be strong. She taught me how to be strong. She taught me, her mama, you don't just give up. You fight to get what you want. So I'm here today to celebrate her life, not to feel sorry for myself. I'm just here to share the beautiful life which God gave me with her for these 31 years. And I'm happy to say, thank God. Thanks God for that. And uh, if it wasn't for God, maybe she should have been gone a long time ago. Now that when she grew up, to go back a little bit further there, she tried anything, anything, and in, even including to try and touch a live snake. She was a person who liked to try things. If she doesn't try, she thought, Hore, then it wasn't okay with her, Hore. Then maybe she can find out, Hore, how is this, this thing dangerous and how it can be nice for her. She played with cows. There is one photo which I showed O'Neill. I asked him to put it in the video so that people can see. In 2018, I went home at the Kettle Post. And then Kettle Post is like a farm. I don't know if you call it a Kettle Post even here in South Africa. In Botswana, it's something like a farm. So when I got there, one of my cows gave birth to a calf and then he died. And then I took that calf and then I put it inside my car. I drove it with it to Palato where I'm staying. When I got there, I fed it with the bottle milk with the bottle to make it grow up. 2019, Naledi came for Christmas. She found this calf there. I made a crawl for it behind the house. So Naledi just arrived. So she walked through the house at the back and then she found this calf. And then she didn't ask her, what is this? What is going on with this? She just got inside the crawl and then she started playing with it. She was full of mud and all kinds of things. And then she walked in the house like that. And then I said to her, ah, what happened to you now, Wena? And then she said to me, I was at the back. And then I asked him, are you doing what? She said, I was with the calf. So during the day, it was Christmas. We were decorating the Christmas tree. She went on to catch that calf to put the Christmas pattern on the calf. And they took all the Christmas things. She wanted to put it on the legs. And then now the calf is running because now it doesn't know what is happening. She put the bell of Christmas on the calf ear. And then the noise which the bell made scared the calf. And then she called me. She said to me, Mama, I said to you, yeah, she said, come here. And then I said to her, what have you done now? She said, come look. So I come there. Now she, she's expecting me to hold the running calf so that she can climb on top of it just to get a photo to show her ring. In Christmas, she was sharing Christmas with the calf. And then I said to her, lady, this is an animal. We won't be able to hold it. To hold it, you need to tie it. But now she wants me to hold it while it's running. And then I said to her, it will never work. She said to me, Mama, hold it. So we stood there, and then we end up arguing about the calf because the calf is running, and then she wants to climb on top. So she was really this angel which came on this earth to come and show some people, including me and friends and family, for how things have been done. 
She contested in many things at home. She was once Miss Spa. When she was seven years old at school, they had this drama, and she was Joseph in this drama. She was Joseph. O'Neill saw the pictures. I don't know why he didn't put it here. She was wearing a big thing, just a big gown, and you can only see the eyes. And uh, she was so happy. She was always happy when she does these things. And uh, it came to a point where I started realizing her, even though she was born in a family where she was alone, she wasn't that spoiled. She grew up nicely, knowing exactly Hore, what is wrong and what is right. She knew whenever I say to her, Naledi, that is wrong. She knows her, her mother means her, that is wrong. She won't try and do that wrong thing again. I've seen her suffering. Last year, when she got this disease first time, she wasn't really sick that much. This disease was just a, a test. She was just a test to her life. She was bouncing around. She was doing whatever. She was gymming. She was, well, she was just happy. But when it came back now this year, it came back with something else, which even me, her mother, I didn't expect it to see it that way. But she was a fighter. She was very strong. We believe, Corey, somehow, somehow, she'll make it. Until the time when she went to the hospital, like uh, Dr. Tabo just said, and then she met these doctors who play God to her life. Because now she was living this life where she gets to be told, Hore, you must know, Hore, you only have a few months to live. All these things, they were happening to her while she was sick. And I think hearing that really made her to think, Hore, uh -uh, maybe now this time is not my time. She fought with everything she had. She fought with everything she had, and I was so proud of her. She used to say to me, Mama, and then I said to her, yeah, she said to me, you know what? And then I said to her, no, I don't. She said to me, you know the reason why I can't dance? And then I said to her, no, I don't. And then she'll, she'll come to me, and then she kiss my cheek, and then she said to me, it's because you don't know how to dance, mama. <laughs> when people were going to the discos, going to the movies, when you chose down, you chose to sit down and sleep. You know, if you went to the discos and this video things to go ahead and enjoy with others, maybe I wouldn't have been better than you. That is only the thing which we were arguing about all the time. Because she'll be accusing me for the way she doesn't dance is just because of me. And then I say to her, no, 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 no. I can dance better than you do. It's like what she was doing there in the movie when she was with O'Neill by the hot balloon. You saw her, she was standing there and she was moving her legs like this. That is what she's, call, she's calling my dance. She say, I do like that. So that is all she can do. She can never move in any way differently than what she was just doing there. She was really a wonderful daughter to have. I used to have problems when I was with her. I couldn't even stand like this in front of people. I couldn't. But what I have experienced with her when she was sick and what she's been through, made me very strong. I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for what I saw her going through. That made me tougher. And I'm sure wherever she is right now, if she's watching this now or right now, I'm standing here talking. She's slapping hands. 
she's so happy. Because as much as she knows her mother, she's a very emotional person. She never wants me to lose it in front of people. But sometimes it gets too much. Then you won't be able to hold it. But this time, I really feel very strong to share all this with you enjoying her life. And I'm sure I'll keep on being strong and I'll get stronger and stronger every day. As long as I believe Hore, she's watching over me and God is watching over me, I'll go beyond where I am that right now. Naledi, there are many things which she did at home. Like I said, she is multi-talented. Her father was an artist. Nadidi learned how to do paintings. She was painting also. She did all kinds of things at home. And the only thing, the other thing which I love to tell you about her is Naledi had have a hand. She had a hand to give. She had a hand to help. She had, or if she can see her, maybe you are trying to do something and then you are not getting it right. She'll go out of her way to help to make sure that you get that thing right. At home, she left few kids who she was looking after. Every time when it's Christmas, like now, we have to drive all over the place giving those kids presents, doing whatever she wants. If she wants to take them with her car to go to the cattle post where we always slaughter sheep and make braai, she will take them. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. And whatever happened, whatever didn't happen, the only thing I know about my daughter, she was a wonderful person. And she'll always be like that. Wherever she is right now, I'm sure she's calling maybe her age group now to go under the tables so that she can teach them something. <laughs> it's a little bit painful for she was only with one daughter I have and then she left from this earth without having a child. If that one, your name, is a bit difficult and there is no way going around it. Because if she had a child, I was going to teach that child exactly what she was doing to other people's children. <laughs> I was going to t make sure for that child keep Naledi's legacy, keep it going. Because what she did, even though now she was sometimes being naughty, but it was just something which nobody will ever understand. Only her will understand. Because she believed in herself for Rihanna. She can mix up everything. Even if she bagger up something, like she always say, her father taught her, Hore, if you destroy something, you're buggering it up. So she'll always bagger up things, and then she'll manage to fix them again. It doesn't matter what it is. She'll tear a dress and then she asks me, Mama, put the needle, cotton on a needle, I want to sew. She'll do that. And uh, lastly, I want to thank all the people of South Africa, all who has been with Naledi through the tough road which he, she, she went, everybody, friends, everybody, daughter all the South Africans who has been there for her, even when I was in there. Because it was a bit tough sometimes for her. I have to rush home and come back. But she had families here in South Africa. She had true friends here in South Africa. She had brothers and sisters. She had good doctors. 
There is one lady who I would want to mention who is not here because I can see her, she's not here, is the lady who was helping her with the oxygens. Her name is Chantel. That lady, she went through everything. When the doctors that said they will be refusing to give her oxygen, she will make a plan. She will be driving in the middle of the night while we are sleeping, knocking at the door, delivering the oxygen. It doesn't matter what time it was. She was always there for an lady and me. And she was always happy. She always had this smile. She was like this doctor sitting here in front of me with the glasses. I don't can't even remember his name, but he's watching me. He put everything together himself without me even asking. He risked his time of being with his patients so that he can put squeeze Nalady in to help him. And he made sure Hore, always Nalady was his first patient. His name is Tabo. One day told Nalady at the hospital Hore, she only have three days to live. He said to Nalady, they are lying. I was there. And the painful thing is the doctor will just open the door and rush in without looking around the corner or who is around the corner. And then they just talk. And then after they talk, they'll pretend they didn't talk. But it's too late. The other person who is around the corner, they already hear everything. They told Nalidu Hore she won't make it to a birthday. He made it. And I'm very happy and very proud of what he did for my daughter, at least to see her birthday. Because she wanted to go up to there. She wanted to see her birthday so much. Even though on her birthday, she was in the hospital, but she was there. And uh, I hope and pray for the love you gave Naledi, wherever I am, you'll always give it to me. because she had a lot of people who love her here. That's why it was so beautiful and so nice and so, I don't know, I don't have words to explain it, just to make this memorial service so that she can say goodbye to the people of South Africa. I'll always be proud of that. I'll always be happy. I'll carry that everywhere I go. And thanks to Blakey, there is a man called Blakey here. Thanks to him for running around. I know he's homeboy, but he can't say anything here. He better go and say it outside. Because if he can say it here, he'll be in trouble. Because I have Nalidi's family here. And Dudu, and this one, the muscle, the muscle what? Bodybuilder. The bodybuilder. Also, I'm saying thanks to him and everybody who contributed to make this day to be successful and happening. I'm very happy about that. I really appreciate it. And I'll keep this in my mind wherever I go. Horiyari. She really had a family there. She had a lot of people there. She wasn't lost. She wasn't lost. And I'll cherish this moment until until. Thank you, guys. I love you. What a force. What a force. And what a fighter. And uh, no, Bob's not the Red Berets. I mean, the spirit of resilience, the, the tenacity, the never giving up spirit of Naledi. She was truly an amazing woman, an amazing young lady, and will forever be indebted to you, Bahumi. 
for having blessed the world and having blessed us as friends, industry people, um, lovers, and many others with your daughter. Indeed, had 31 years of life on this earth, left an indelible mark that we will never forget. And for that, we truly thank you. Um, Sophia, uh, over to you, ma'am. process of running around, handling the logistics and everything it took to put this together and also what's to come after today, we 
found very little time to process the grief that is supposed to come with the passing of Naledi. Because our minds were preoccupied with putting things together, making sure things happen. And we had this conversation with, with Dudu sometime during the course of the week about her speaking. And she wasn't too sure if she would be able to, to actually do it. And I think having the audience congregated here and everyone sitting here and the program unfolding, it's starting to become more of a reality. It was a distant thing, something that we would unintentionally shut out because we were busy and we could afford to, to shut it out. But with this happening, it, now, it is now starting to become a reality. And uh, I can understand why my friend would not be able to speak, but she has requested her sister Jabu to, to read her message on, on her behalf. Jabu? Um, but before Jabu speaks, uh, Dudu's daughters, the cousins, the twins, I'll not mention them by name, they also recorded audio tributes to Naledi. So we'll play those, and then after that, Jabu will come up and read Dudu's message. Thank you, Naledi. I'm going to miss you. Well, you still were God in heaven. I remember all the memories when you always used to watch the rest of world with us, and we always and you always used to give us sweets. And I love you. I'm gonna miss you so much. I feel like crying now because you were very really nice to us. Did we watch movies with you? <laughs> Dear Auntie Naledi, it is so unfortunate that this day has come so soon. I thank you for other memories that we have together, the good and the bad. Thank you for always spoiling us, even though you were strict at times, but I think you meant well by it. May you rest in peace, Na Legend. Auntie Naledi, I hope you can hear this and that you're resting well in heaven and that you're having a good time there. I bet you're playing some more VR because, like, you are very good at it. They're better than me than that. And thank you for always putting a smile on your face. Thank you for always doing so much for us. Thank you for all the fun movie nights. And I really enjoyed the times with you. And, yeah, I hope you rest in peace. Dear I love that you gave us treats and sweets, and I think I still have some more sweet left. I will miss you a lot. I hope you will have less in peace. I love you from Amina. I could lie, say I like it, like. Like it, like that. Here lies the girl who was punching above her weight. My lady made me promise that those would be my opening lines at her funeral slash memorial. 7th of August, 2020, I got a call from Bob's at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon that would ultimately change the last year and bit of my life, as well as Naledi's. Naledi could talk. On the first phone call, she chowed both my ears off, but it was the part where she spoke about her cancer and her chemo that stuck with me. We dropped the call on Bob's phone, and then she slid into my DMs, and like they say, the rest is history. Because we had a short but intense friendship, I was able to really go back on our conversations, which were rather long, 
and try and document what seemed like a long journey with her. From the DMs, we moved within minutes to WhatsApp, which we felt felt more personal because of the conversations. They quickly became deep. After eventually meeting, clicking, and getting along like a house on fire, we became an inseparable duo, a duo that would annoy and irritate O'Neill, especially without working. But after my lady got done with radiation, she slowly started feeling like her old self again. She just wanted to live life. Much to the disapproval of O'Neill on some of her choices, I understood where he was coming from as a big brother, but I also understood where my lady was coming from. My only advice to her at the time was to listen to her body, which she did. We would have fun on the streets and also absolutely love chilling in bed when we were together or talk on the phone for hours. And we would jokingly say, geez, look at how late it is. We should have been in the streets. Now, for anyone that knows B, knows that November is a shutdown month for her. Now, Lady and B had a joint whirlwind birthday tour last year. They shut down Johannesburg and Cape Town. Then they traveled to Dubai and Nigeria. My lady was living her best life, and she was loving it and having the time of her life. My lady and B returned from the birthday trip for a couple of days, and then before my lady could even unpack her bag and do laundry, our plans of a dirty December started. She left for Dubai again and Nigeria. This trip was different. Admin to try and leave this time was a frustrating one. She had ticket issues. She had visa issues. I even said to her. The guards don't want you to go and live your best life without me. She did try and convince me to go with her, but I'm a single mother of two, and it was towards the end of the school year. Listening to her, all her itinerary issues was a nightmare. My lady eventually made it to Nigeria to meet B after spending a few days sorting out her issues. In her time alone in Dubai, one of those days on probably the 40th call of the day, she says, "I have something to tell you." I have been trying to avoid it, but I'm not okay. I said, "Calm down. What's up, girl?" She said, "I've been feeling my breasts, and I feel a lump, and I think the cancer is back." After a lengthy conversation, we agreed that we wouldn't overthink it. We agreed that she would be present during her trip and continue to live her best life. We agreed that we would just softly alert the doctor and make an appointment for when she returns to run some tests. My lady landed back in South Africa, 10th of December, at half past four. 11 December at noon, she was squeezed in to check the lump she found. We met at Park Lane and discussed many scenarios in the car as we waited her turn. That was my first of many appointments I did with my lady. 15 December, we were at Mill Park to see Prof. Carol Ben, and Prof. Carol Ben then ordered blood work to be done. During this visit, I recall that Prof. Ben indicated that the cancer has probably returned, but wanted to do scans to be sure. Prof. Ben told my lady to try and not overthink anything, and offered her her house in Cape Town to go and relax. On the 16th of December, we started putting together a bucket list of things we wanted to do together. I think at this stage we knew the cancer was indeed back, but it was for now the doctors to it was now for the doctors to determine. At what stage we were at, it was on this day that I made a promise to her. 17 December at nine o'clock, my lady had her scan scheduled. 18th of December, my lady had a morning feedback meeting with the doctors. 24th of December, my lady was back in the hospital attending to admin for the removal of the lump scheduled for Jan. 12th of Jan, my lady was getting her results. 13th, my lady was told that she needed to have an emergency surgery the next day. 14th, my lady is upbeat, and a chatterbox during getting ready for the hospital at around 6 a.m. We check in on each other during the course of the day, and didn't my lady video call me at 3 p.m. before her surgery with the face beat? To my shock and aura, I asked, "Why the face beat?" She jokingly replied and said, "So that if I die, the mortuary has one less worry." Around 7 p.m., she managed to message and inform me that she was awake. In the ward, but just feeling sleepy. January 16th, my lady was discharged. January 21st, my lady had her first oncologist appointment of the year, discussing chemo options. 13th of Feb, my lady started complaining of a bad headache. 
she actually thought it was COVID. That lady went to the ER in Morningside. The side pain she complained about was fluids in the lung. She got a tap which produced 500 mils of fluid. This would be her first of many taps. The highest fluid we drained from her taps was 1.5 liters from her lungs. In that same visit, because of the bad headache she was having, a scan of the brain was done as well as her lungs. The results now showed us that Naledi had cancer of the lungs and of the brain. The breast cancer had become metastatic. The cancer had moved. Naledi shared that when she started seeing stars, she knew something was wrong in her brain, and she put some pressure while in hospital to get scans done. Fourth of March, we started radiation of the brain. We had to hold chemo plans in order to deal with the brain cancer through radiation. Now, Lady now knew she was fighting for her life because the doctors had given her three months to live. During this time, now Lady read and did research and learned of alternative medication. Alternative medication does not believe in radiation or chemo. With pain in her eyes, one day she asked me, gee, what must I do? Should I ditch chemo and radiation and try alternative medication, or should I carry on with radiation and chemo? That was heavy. I told her I couldn't answer that question. All I can do is support your decision and ride or die with you. We packed our bags after getting a green light from her doctors to take off our trip to Botswana to meet her mom and for her to show me around her town. Fun was had. I must mention that we did that trip high on pethidine because she had a persistent pain in her sternum and was struggling to move. We had to mask her pain from her mother. After trying everything to help mask the pain, the only thing that she said helped her was wearing a waist trainer. After our week in Botswana, we came back and immediately went to go get a scan for the pain in the sternum. As we are awaiting results, doctor, as I started calling her, said, gee, I have bone cancer. I said, stop self-diagnosing yourself. We got the call with the results and indeed the cancer had moved to the bone. Our radiation doctor never told us the side effects of the brain radiation. We found that out the hard way. Naledi at this point had been living with me for some time. Naledi's speech started to be affected. She was stuttering uncontrollably at one point, which frustrated her. Another side effect she had was a seizure. After radiation, we were able to start with chemo. The oncologist and Naledi chose a less brutal one to the first one they used in 2020, because she said she almost died on that one. April 12th, Naledi's hair started falling off. The specific chemo started giving her paralysis in the form of pins and needles under her feet and on her hands. Walking became a mission. She could barely open a bottle of water with her hands. Naledi's pain became too much for her. Her doctors introduced her to morphine. In my personal opinion, this is where my friend started deteriorating. Sleeping became a problem. We would go nights without sleep, especially on days she would say, gee, I'm scared to sleep. I would wake up during the night several times and look at Naledi to see if she was still breathing. The only position she would find some relief in was a sitting position. So for days, Naledi would sleep in that position. But we weren't told about the morphine side effects, the hallucinations. Boy, was that scary. It got so bad, I had to find a way to convince her to go to the ER. Eventually, I got it right, and she was then admitted. The doctor said to her that her white blood count was so low that had she been 15 minutes later, she would have died. Now, lady soldiered on. We had an unnecessary surgery around winter time because she was in so much pain. Pethidine injections increased from just in the evenings to three times a day. That area became infected. Naledi was struggling to breathe. Her lung capacity had shrunk. Because of this, Naledi in the evening time would be on an oxygen machine. When the breathing got worse, Naledi became dependent on the machine and was now towards the end on permanent oxygen. Meaning, if we had doctor's visits, we unplug the machine and move her to the tank, which had to be done with speed, because even three seconds without oxygen was a struggle. When Naledi's mom came to South Africa, it was at this time that the doctor said there is nothing more they can do for her and that she is in her dying phase. In April, Naledi said, 
If I make it to my birthday, I'm not dying, G. On the 1st of November, I sent her a calendar and said, we made it, G. Her response was, not yet, G. My birthday is the 11th. And I said, all that matters is that we are in November. My lady said, G, I got to make it to Christmas now. My lady was in hospital just before her birthday. And on her birthday, the doctor said that they would discharge her because it was her birthday, not because she was OK but because they didn't want her to spend her, hospital, her birthday in hospital. O'Neill and I had to scrap the plans we had for her and respect her wishes of resting that day. Towards the end, Naledi knew it was the end. The week before Naledi passed, I told her the reality, that the reality was painful to bear. She told me to allow myself to feel every emotion and to stop trying to be hard. And in the same sentence, she said, I'm trying hard to fight G, and my response was, hold on G. 16 December 2020, I, Dutuzuma, made a promise to Naledi to stand by her and go to every doctor's appointment with her and nurse her. I am happy to say I kept my promise to you. It wasn't easy. We fought, we argued, but I stood by you. On my birthday, 19th of May, you said you would never know how to thank me. My G, it was my honor. During one of our during one of our crazy late night chats, you made me promise that if I were to ever be unresponsive, that I would fight for you and do whatever I could do to save you. I want to tell you that I did just that. When some around your bed said you should die at home, I fought the ambulance to come and give you a fighting chance. I asked you to hold on, G. I know you fought. I watched it every day this year. Rest, my G. You deserve it. I want to thank my family, Andutu, Pumi, and Moshe, my daughters, my nieces and nephew, my friends, my household staff, Matthew, George, my buddy, and whoever came into contact with Naledi through me. Your love, patience, and unwavering support has been amazing. When I would travel, they stood in the gaps. O'Neill, I have no words. Just thank you. Rest, my G. You deserve it. So, chemo number four was on Monday, and I'm in hospital again. <sighs> Although not due to emergency, but definitely because my side effects were insurmountable with the home remedies and prescribed medications. I've been vomiting and nauseous and a lot of pain. And that what has, that's what has me, um, <laughs> it's what has me here in hospital listening to Billie Eilish feeling sorry for every heartbreak I've ever had. <laughs> I know where it's facing, I was, I was setting it up. How about on It's gonna be for my reality show. Um, I'm just doing a video because I can't type and be a doctor at the same time. I haven't, well, I've drawn the medication before I started. So it's just that the injection is there, just four mils, it's two vials. You just take the air out, and this goes in the bum. And it takes special skills to inject yourself in the bum, so... I was just gonna call you and show you how far we've come. But yeah. Let me, um focus on this and allow you to charge your phone. There is a possibility of cardiac arrest on route. 
I've explained we cannot do any advanced interventions right now. So it would be DLS CPR for eight minutes if there's no change it is declaring as per current protocols. It's time. The only person who is going to do this in this room, everyone else, they'll have to take it down. <clears throat> Dimela, um, good afternoon, everyone. You guys chose the worst time to bring me up because after that video, <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> um, the role of a brother has to be the toughest one. Um, because you're also not allowed to, to show weakness because by nature of you being a brother, you are the punching bag to a large extent, especially in the, in the case of Naledi. So I've been trying to figure out how I can frame my conversation about her and it's difficult because I've, I've got so many chapters with Naledi. There's the chapters in Botswana. There's the chapter where we reconnected. Um, Naledi used to refer to us to those who know us as twins. Uh, she said we shared a brain. Um, and we did. We did. We did. Um, for context, for those who are in South Africa, because what happened was Naledi was in Botswana, uh, which is where she's from, and I was, and she moved to South Africa. Her and I lost touch for, I think, about close to 10 years. And when we reconnected, it was like we've ne we had never parted. We caught up, and... You know, the fire was there, the, the banter was there, the, um, the insults. Those who know my relationship with Naledi, uh, they know it's characterized by insults. Like we literally spend all day insulting one another. Before I even um, continue, there's one particular person that I want to, to thank. Um, her name is Sis Tando. Um, Sis Tando is, I don't know. Everybody here spoke about being there for a lady and st standing by a lady. But when we would see Naledi and we would leave. We'd visit her and we would leave. Sis Tando was her helper. So she saw what we have not seen. She saw things that I don't even think she would be able to express. So while she's not here, I wanted to just take this opportunity to just, in a very small way, honor her for having done the dirty work that when we got a little tired and we retired to our quarters, to our homes, there was no time off for her. She would continue the work, the difficult work of looking after Naledi. <sighs> Naledi and I have had countless 
countless conversations. If you knew anything about that girl, she could document every aspect of anything. Naledi could speak from here to the end of the world. She was such a talker. She was very verbose. She explained everything. She was so detailed about everything. I remember the first time when I met her, <laughs> she, it was through a broken heart. She was, she was dating some rapper guy in Botswana. And I was on radio at the time in Botswana, and she was also training. And I think she shadowed me for a bit. Then after having conversations with her, she, I don't know, found a brother in me, I suppose. So then I didn't know anything about this guy that she was dating. So this guy breaks her heart, and Naledi looks for me and finds me and ends up at my place. So she knocks on the door, and I open the door. This skinny, white, uh, colored girl. <sighs> the reason why I'm saying white girl is because the joke was that we called each other names. She called me Blackie for context, and I called her Whitey. So this girl <laughs> is holding a bottle of vodka, absolute vodka, and she is wasted. So I open the door, and then she almost collapses on the floor. So I ask her, what's going on? How do you even know where I stay? She says, no. The same guy who broke her heart actually dropped her off at my place, the nerve. So, so then I sit down with her. One thing about me, you must know I'm, and this is not hyperbolic in any way. I was raised on survival. So I don't, well, I'm fine now, but I think growing up, I didn't, I don't experience love the same way people do. I perceive it. So that's how I was. And I really must apologize because this conversation is going to be a little bit all over the place. But one thing about me is I'm honest and it's going to be graphic to a large extent. And Nalidi expects exactly that of me. This is why she actually placed me in the position she did. So anyway, so I spoke to her and I said, what's going on? Why are you drunk in my house? And she said to me, you know, this guy. So I sit with her for the next couple of days, almost like grooming her, but without even realizing. Just trying to teach her about life. So most of Nalidi's friends talk relentlessly about the shade. They call it shade. Believe me, that started with me. It started with me, we would sit and because of how I expressed my love for her, she learned to survive what she was going through, through tough love, the tough love that I was giving her. It wasn't necessarily intentional tough love on my part, but what it was is, that's what I knew. That's all I knew how to, I, I didn't know, you, you, you show up in my house at the time and you're crying, I don't know, Am I, can I just at least give you money to stop crying? Like, I wouldn't know what to do at that time. So Nalidi would spend so much time with me. She started alienating all of her friends, and then she ended up, there were times when I was speaking, and I'm listening to, rather, when Nalidi is speaking, and she sounded exactly like me. It was scary. It was quite scary. So then I would later learn that Nalidi has what is called... Uh, adaptable competence. So Naledi is a sponge. It doesn't matter what environment she's in. If Naledi is hanging out with a doctor, which she spent most of her final days with, if you have a conversation with her, you are in trouble because you are going to be speaking to a doctor th through Naledi. And if Naledi was sitting next to Say, car park security, and she spent time talking to this particular person for a week. Before you know it, she sounds exactly like him. She cracks the same jokes as him. So that was the thing about Naledi. And I suppose this explains why everyone talks about her intellect. I don't think you will ever come across the level of intellect that Naledi carried. And I don't even think we were able to tap into it. We were never able, we will never be able to understand the extent to which Naledi was intelligent. 
But through being intelligent, you also have the capacity to reduce yourself or minimize yourself for the aid of those who cannot meet you at your level. So most people experience they're at a level where an lady had minimized herself to, to suit the narrative, which was rather unfortunate for most, most of the times. So to move to us reconnecting in Jobek, we reconnected just, uh, just before her divorce. And then we were inseparable. She spent most of my time with me. She would come to my place and she would drink lizard wine. Now, lady was highly disrespectful to me. So I offered her wine the one day. And the next day she wanted to come by. She says, do you have that wine that, I, that you offered me? And I said, which one? And she said, I think it, it's got a picture of a lizard. So from then on, she would call, <laughs> she'd call it lizard wine. She would say, I'm on my way. I'm coming to have lizard wine. So this is what characterized my relationship with Nalid. She comes, knocks on the door. I open. I insult her. For the next 10 minutes, she's going to try and find something to insult me on. She'll, go, she'll probably go to the fridge and open and say, let's see what poverty looks like today. And then... <laughs> And then we will laugh the whole day. We'll sit there. So what she found in me, this is what, you know, as I've been going through our chats and conversations, I think what she found in me is what she couldn't find in the streets. Well, with Dudu. Dudu was responsible for twerking. I was responsible for cracking the whip when she came home um, to listen to stories about boyfriends to try and stop her from sneaking out on Valentine's Day to go see her douchebag of a boyfriend. I did say I'm. So that was the nature of my relationship with her. I settled into that role. I hated it for a while, but I ended up settling into it because it, it wasn't long before I realized that Everything I am up to this point, everything I, I cannot express about myself, God sent this girl to be able to express that or to at least express that on my behalf. She expresses what I could not express. She, and this is no line or anything, that girl was the missing puzzle in my life. She completed me. There's another video where she talks about us finishing each other's sentences. I've got friends who would say, why, why, why haven't you guys dated? Keba is one of those. They would hound me about dating. And I would say, I can't date. None of it is my sister. Like, that's exactly what it was. Our relationship was so honest and so brutal that I can comfortably tell you that right now, Nalid is resting with some of my secrets. And I'm going to take some of her secrets with me to, the, to my grave. We, in one of our many conversations before she passed, she said to me, the first instruction I got was about the phones, that as soon as I die, the phones, before they go to anyone else, go in there and delete So, so all of you here, you must know, I know, <laughs> and I've seen things. Do you do, every now and then I mention something, but I still don't go all the way. Guys, I've never seen so many notes in my life that I've had to delete, I'm sorry, to the pastor. But such... Such was the nature of my relationship with my lady. There was no line. There was absolutely no line. She was not perfect. But my lady would try, man. My lady, at the beginning of the first video, she speaks about being able to withstand the military pain. She was not lying. I don't know any stronger human being. I, 
honestly do not. This is, this is not a superlative. I don't know anyone who was as strong as Naledi. When she was diagnosed, she told me about the first lump. We went together. I was in the room with her. The douchebag was supposed to be there. He didn't show up. By the way, she would want me to do this. And I recorded the entire conversation between her and the doctor. And she sat me down and said, we've always had a, a unique relationship, but from now on, I'm asking you to walk this journey with me. It was the toughest conversation I've ever had with anyone, because I didn't know what it actually meant. What, what is it that I'm supposed to do? But she helped me through it. She guided me through the process. And most times, because of the connected brain aspect, I would know what she wants and what she doesn't need. <sighs> but there was one dynamic throughout this entire process. There was one dynamic where at the beginning of this, Naledi seemed to not be present. I suppose it's the nature of the psychological aspect of what she was dealing with. She to put it simply, it, it, was, it was almost like she didn't care much for herself. It, she placed everything else high on the radar compared to the cancer. So I was more worried about the cancer than she was from the beginning. And I didn't understand it. So even when I was shouting at her about something, it would be, dude, shouldn't you be having cancer? And she obviously downplayed. And we began these jokes about cancer. And lady made it so easy for us to walk the path with her, everyone will know, because the amount of cancer jokes and jokes on death were insurmountable. Every day, at least 10. In fact, we had a grading system, a rating system, where if I told the best joke, she would say to me, I think that's some of your finest work up to date. And I will do the same thing with her. I'm tempted to tell our first ever cancer joke. But I don't think you'll ever look at me the same ever again. But I'll try. So we're sitting in my, uh, in my apartment. We're sitting outside in the garden. She, that's when the hair started falling off. So she had a comb in her hand, and then she started combing herself, and the hair started falling off. And she says, dude, I'm going to the bathroom. Come with me. So she's walking to obviously go look at herself in the mirror. I'm sitting outside. And I, I just sat there. I was on my phone. She says, dude, are you coming? I said, yes, I'm on my way. She's like, how would you know which bathroom I'm in? This is her she's, as she's speaking. <sighs> I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. And I said... Don't worry, I will just follow the trail of your pubic hair. That was the nature of my relationship with Nalid. And she appreciated that, and she, that's how we told each other we loved each other. I have never said to Nalid, I love you, ever, in our years. And she's never done that. So... Nalidi said to do, do that, I like to act tough in my absence. And she said that she doesn't think I'll be able to cope once she's gone. When Dudu said that, I didn't even fight it. I said she was right. She was absolutely right. This was my biggest fear, that I've never cried in my life, and 
Today's the day I'm going to cry in bulk. For lost lovers, <laughs> mortgages. <laughs> it's all coming. <laughs> Thank you, Naledi. Guys, look, I will continue to tell the Naledi story. I, I promised myself this is not enough for me to do this. The voice notes I have, the texts I have, there's 10 books out of Naledi that are sitting with me and even some of you guys. I, I'm still trying to figure out how we are going to do this. But I want to thank all of you immensely. Naledi's friends, doctors, the technical team, Jafta and the team, Temba, Sonia, there are people who just brought it together. Like, everybody who came through, thank you in no small measures. Thank you. I didn't know half of you. I've came across, I've seen you once in a while. But Nalidi said to her mother, this is how she left her mother, she said, don't worry, Mama. O'Neill knows. <sighs> Those are the heaviest words I've ever heard. And from that moment, I didn't know what she meant. I was trying to figure out what did she mean by O'Neill would know. And then every day when I get up and I don't know what to do next, I just find myself getting in the car and I go. And then before I sleep, I'll even talk to Judy. I'll say, she actually knew. She knew before I knew that I will know what to do. I still don't know what I'm doing. But I know that I will know the next day. And it's through the support of my friends, Dudu, who's now the butt of my jokes, by the way, <laughs> and Sipo. Sipo is the admin guy. Naledi had one more request for some of us, and I'm going to extend it to all of you. She said, guys, look after my mother. She cared deeply for her mother. The story about them being connected and feeling the pain, uh, well, pain at the same time, I experienced it. There was a time I had the tough job of having to manage three conversations. I, had, I almost have a, had a nervous breakdown because Nalidi was keeping certain things from Dudu and she was keeping certain things from her mother. And mom, uh, Nalidi's mother was keeping certain things from Nalidi. Dudu was keeping certain things from Nalidi. Nalidi was keeping certain things from her mother. I don't know if that even makes sense. But when I get up, I'll manage three different conversations and each one of them expecting me not to talk to the other one. I didn't even know I could do that. But through this process and this angel that we're celebrating here today, my own strength was realized in the process. And my capacity to love, I experienced it for the first time in my later years. I no longer perceive love, I experience it. And it's through her that I'll continue to exist. Thank you all for honoring my sister, my friend. <sighs> See the, the problem that you've left me with now. Sizwe, do you want to quickly come say a word about my lady? You want to? Yeah, let me give you a moment to reflect. You can come through quickly. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm broken, don't worry. I'm Sizwe, 
I'm the caretaker where Nalet is, was staying in Princeton. Uh, I'll be short. I know Nalet almost for two years now. Uh, she was like my lawyer. She was my friend. She was my sister. The first time she came in that complex, uh, I knew I've got a sister because I don't have a sibling. Uh, I was born alone also. She got trust issues. Uh, she's a mind reader. She can know who she can trust or somebody she, she, she doesn't want near here. So every time, the first time I got uh, trust issues, good trust from her, it was when she was in Dubai. The first time I spoke with her through a video call with Brother O'Neill. Uh, now lady was a soft person who can express herself if you could give her time. The most broken moments to me is that uh, the, the last week she got I should be yeah. Being Semakai, we were phone and Semakai, what he would say, Ugopi. Was it in Joba and she looting the West and Yamakai? What Umung Echo, La Pekai, Bassing at our common, the complex scene. In them Passa Bracul, what's a mess, William Chaben, Befun Kulmanam, Anga was finally again. Umas Wami Ube Umunto no Tando, or was Uxiza, Umunto met Agagil, and also Song his cars. So Taluk Risukbong, Gusis Tando, Obe we no Bem says, then Tom Bum Soto, a Sinai Jenga Marsh. Ubunzi Menguzel, we are bars, Sis Tando. Bengwaz was in Hamben, now Sisnalet, a shyly motto, M. Quatrain, and one. A team was so, Guband us on the linen nab. What a clean name, Ubewaz was a phony Lucy's toto, Ubewaz was a figure car, a hambang auction, auction set a linen worker, a shyly motto. We are going to get some megas tea and <laughs> Because Ube umuntu no tando, utandu uti, ngaso songi skazi, ushalu chabuli. Umama, uba hume, ube suma ngabese makai bozwani, imina ebe nguazu uti, nkumane nae, ngomba be nshala nae, beslala ubsukbonke no sisi na leti. Ngobu be umuntu ube ngasaguazu kutolu mchongu, ube ngasaguazu blala. Numa be mshambu kutu kufigu sisi tutu, uput onele, Ekinen bing melasa le nam nisho usi somsi zayo ubeham ba la la phone le milang se sangwe e rumin aja trendot bing elusi zosha la so guzego se kelele isifosa ke so kinang negezi mshamba besegu inzele usang boni susi zoham 
umanje ngifake isikipa sakha ngikeza sibhale Williams 20 lesi sikipa isipho sakhe sokugcina ngikeza sona ngaphangu ukuthi hama angunawo amaningi eh into engizoyicela kubo bonke abantu abafike bezomsiza qala ugula umdalisa phansi ugula evuka esinda ukuze kufike kulolu suku lwa namhlanje nikhombisa ubumbano nothando bengicela ukuthi kungagcini ngiyena usesinaleti nikwenze nakwabanye ngiphukele emoyeni angikho muhle ngoba ngiqede isonto lonke ledlule engakhona ukulala bengimbona nje ngoba ungenzele okuhle kodwa empilweni bengifisa ukuthi nalazo olala khona ngiyofika ngifinyelele khona kubo uze ngazi ukuthi ngolunye usuku ngivakashe lumama omzalayo angnawo maningi ukozithela umusi okwehlula ukufa akusoze kwawe ehlula umphefumulo yabo Sibonga yakhulu umfwethu usizwe You will probably be seeing me for for the last time I'm going to hand over to Trina and the team and after which uh, the pastor Pastor Nono from Tuakai will come and uh, deliver a brief message but before I go I would like to thank all our speakers I would like to thank everyone that came and and honored this occasion um I know Sonia O'Neill has already thank you but I would like to thank you once again um without mentioning names and creating enemies out of everyone that feels that they were thanked and not thanked but I would truly love to show my appreciation and gratitude to everybody that has made a contribution and has come to support this occasion with their presence and before I go American playwright novelist and uh, poet Langston Hughes in one of his short pieces dreams he writes and says life without dreams is like a broken winged bird that cannot fly my lady dead to dream she dreamt like she was going to live forever and she lived like she was going to die tomorrow and the challenge that i would like to leave with everyone here is that dare to dream be like my lady you've been a wonderful audience thank you so much this is the last time you'll be seeing me on the podium just going to do it. you've been sitting for a while you can just stand just for us to worship mfundisa sa zongena and just to encourage you my brother uh, you've gone through the west now is so i thought uma would be here there's a hymn that we all know we'll do it in sutu that says joko ya how ibu be
come join me. Age koso kam onje ngawe kuba kuba i tema zake simi le simi go na pagate simi. Jesus, amen. I greet you all in the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, Moses dies, Kicha, and death thought it had won. Abraham, the father of faith, dies. Death thought it had won. Joseph dies. Death thought it had won. Hannah, the woman of prayer, dies. 
and death thinks it has won. But go down 4,000 years later. It's a Friday. The location is Golgotha. Jesus dies and death thought it had won. But come Sunday morning, when life responded to death, death had to obey. And I want to greet the family and friends that are here and say, death is not a respecter of people. It goes to the rich, it goes to the poor, it goes to the young, it goes to the old, it goes to whites, it goes to the black people, it goes to Asia, it comes to Africa. Death is not a respecter of people. And me and you are confronted by a fact that is something that we need to accept, a reality. That somehow, somehow, in this journey of life, me and you will face this thing called death. Now, question is, are you ready? I was sitting there, I was listening to everyone that spoke, and I realized life is not about the duration in which you spend or the number of years that you have living, but it's the impact that you make in the little time that you have. Now, lady was only 31 years of age, but the impact she has, she reached the caretakers where she stayed. She reached high offices and low offices. And that's what humanity is all about. And I greet the mother, because it's one of mama who wants to come to and to the friends, um, may God comfort you and give you strength in this difficult time. Now, I met a lady once. Um, they were with the crew, O'Neill and them, somewhere in Waterfall, and I popped in to see one of my friends, Kicha. And um, as I, I, I stayed there for a couple of minutes, I, I listened to the conversation, and it was in English because it's how day, you know, how. And two minutes later, I realized that lady speaks it's one. <laughs> and, and after that, I realized, actually, no, she's a son of a woman. And, 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 and from, from there on, I knew that... Uh, this, this, this is one of us. And, and, I, and I take it as an honor to be here to, to speak at a memorial service. Friends, um, I don't preach long sermons. I was taught where I was taught to be a pastor that you, you must become a mini scared preacher. Uh, uh, the lecture said, um, be short but be revealing. I, I, I intend on doing just that. Yeah. I intend on just doing just that. Um, the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5, just to give us strength in this journey of life. Mark chapter 5, um, you can read it when you get home. Mark chapter 5 says, Jesus is passing by somewhere, and there's a man called Jairus, who has a daughter at home who's sick. The Bible says the man was a ruler of a synagogue, if you read the whole chapter. He, he was a ruler of a synagogue, and therefore he, he was a man of affluence and a man of influence. Um, he, he was a great man. But somehow, somehow, he reached a point in his life where his influence and affluence could not handle a certain situation in his home. And I'm here to say to someone, I've lived long enough to understand that there will come a time in life where you'll face something you have no capacity to handle. But when you don't know where to go, 
I want to submit to you that make sure you go somewhere to the throne of God. Where you don't know where to go, there's a place up there where you can submit all your problems. The Bible says, then, then Jairus goes to Jesus. When Jairus gets there, he says to Jesus, my daughter lies at a point of death. Please come to my house and heal her. But if you understand the history between Jesus and the synagogue, Jairus was actually one of the people who denounced the ministry of Jesus. But now he wants help from a man he thinks or a man he believed. He was a problem to the Bible or a problem to the religious sector. But he goes to this man and says, my daughter lies at the point of death. Please come with me to my house so that you can heal it. The Bible says, then, then, then Jesus goes with him. He agrees. He answers the request of Jairus and goes with him to the house. But the story says there was a crowd around Jesus at the time. And as they walked to the house of Jairus, there was a delay. Because of the crowd that was lingering around Jesus. And therefore, the, 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 the arrival of Jesus at the house of Jairus was delayed by the crowd that was around Jesus. So if Jesus was going to take one hour to arrive at the house of Jairus, it was going, the trip was going to take longer because the crowd was there. So Jairus, I want to submit that Jairus walked faster than Jesus so that the trip could arrive quickly at his house. But as they progressed to the house of Jairus, Jesus was behind Jairus and Jairus was leading Jesus. And as they walked, the Bible says there was a woman that came. She had an issue of blood for 12 years. Do you know the story? 12 years, she had a problem. And also at the house of Jairus, there's a daughter that says 12 years. So when Jairus' daughter was born, the problem of the woman was born. So they grew concurrently. One year into the birthday of the child was one year to the problem of the woman. So the years went on and on. The Bible says, as Jesus was going, the woman left her home because she heard that Jesus was passing by. She had tried all doctors and physicians to heal her of her issues. The Bible says she does not know or there's no record or history that Jesus' garment heals conditions. But the woman believes that whatever this man is, he's a solution maker. And the Bible says she goes and touches the garment of Jesus. And the Bible says immediately the blood stopped. And the Bible says after that, Jairus turns. Remember, there's a problem at the house of Jairus. So Jesus must arrive quickly. But at that time, someone is receiving their blessing and miracle. At the expense of Jairus, Jesus should arrive at the house of Jairus. But Jesus has stopped because another woman has to receive a miracle. And Jesus says, I stop because something has left me. Power has left me. And the Bible says, Jesus asked a question, who touched me? And the disciples are arguing with Jesus and they're saying, no, the, the problem is, many people have touched, we also have touched you. But Jesus' argument is the touch was different. For the touch was not the touch of expectation, but the touch was of accessing. And I'm here to tell someone and myself that when we go through this journey of life, don't expect your healing. Access your healing. Don't expect your comfort. Access your comfort. Don't expect a job. Access a job. Faith is not for people who expect things. Faith is for people who access things. And the Bible says, Jairus turns back. Remember, the story is about Jairus. 
Jairus stands back and, and, and looks at this whole situation. Remember, he, Jesus should arrive at his house. But Jesus is has stopped. In other words, the delay is more eminent. Jesus has stopped. And he's asking, who touched me? The Bible says there's a woman that comes and says, I touched you. And she narrates her problem of 12 years. You can't tell a testimony of 12 years in five minutes. So for, 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 for hours, Jairus' problem was there. Jesus was ministering to this woman. And at that time, Jairus' faith is piling up. Because if Jesus could heal the issue of this woman that has 12 years, then he surely would heal my child. But the Bible says when she was done narrating, the Bible says, then word arrives from the house of Jairus that your daughter has died. And the Bible says from the verse 22, when Jesus was quiet and said, I will go with you to my house, from verse 22, Jesus was quiet towards Jairus. But after the daughter died, Jesus wants to speak to him. Jesus was quiet all along. But when the daughter dies, Jesus has the audacity to want to talk to Jairus. And listen to what he says. They say, your daughter has died. Jesus says, don't worry. Keep on believing. But my daughter has died. Why should I keep on believing? Here we learn a principle that situations around us should never define how we feel about God. God is good all the time. His goodness is not dependent by circumstances. His goodness is not dependent on how our locations are. His goodness is not dependent on things what is happening around us. God is good and all the time. That when Jesus says to, 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 to Jairus, keep on believing, the Bible says the position changes. It was Jairus leading Jesus to his house, but it's now Jesus leading Jairus to his house. Many of us in life, we have led God when we are supposed to leave God to lead us. After Jesus says to Jairus, keep on believing, the Bible says Jairus was ahead of Jesus. His daughter has died. His faith has died with the daughter. Jesus says, pick up your face and follow me. And I say this to the family. It is time. And friends, pick up your faith and follow Jesus. And he leads him to the house. When they get to the house of Jairus, the Bible says... When Jesus arrives, he says, stop crying. The daughter is not dead. She's just sleeping. The Bible says, Jesus asked them a question, where have you laid her? And the Bible says they, they, they take him to where she is. And the Bible says, when Jesus arrives, he speaks three words, Talita kum, and the little girl resurrected. You know why? Everything in the hand of God changes at any time. I don't know the situations in your lives. I don't know the pain you feel, Mama. My wife is going to beat me. She had given me tissues. I left them. I must follow Jesus. So, so when Jesus gets to the room where the daughter is lying, friends, the Bible says he utters three words, Talita kum, and the little girl resurrected. And from that story, Rikiha, we realize that death is not the end. It is not over until says God says it's over. There's a soccer team in Soweto that I don't like. It's around the Golden Highway. 
if you are around the Golden Highway, you, you'll see their beautiful place. That soccer team has a lot of supporters. Everyone loves it. It wins nothing, but everyone follows it. And it has a slogan. The slogan says, keep on, it says, rise cause it rise. So whenever they lose, they rise. And you ask yourself what they are rising to. They get beaten by a soccer team from Mamelodi. Time and again, but they say, rise cause it rise. And I want to say to Mama and the friends, when you lose, keep on rising. No matter how difficult it gets, keep on rising. We will lose our loved ones on this side of heaven, but keep on rising. Not only that, we'll also lose our jobs, and lose our cars and houses. Here in the, on earth, we lose things. But here the words of the preacher keep on rising. I, I heard them speaking about vodka. I don't know those things, but only there's a there's a there's a certain whiskey I, I, I saw on TV. <laughs> As a pastor. I saw it. I, it has a tagline that says Johnny Walker. Keep on walking. Mama, life must continue. When you bury your child in Palape, after that, keep on walking. To the friends, keep on walking. Life continues. For those of you who want to make children, make children. Those of you who want to get married, get married. Life must continue. And that's the journey of life. We make it so complicated by not understanding the fundamental principle that life comes from God and life is in God's hand. And I challenge each and every one of us as we go back to our house, homes, make sure that your life is centered around God. If there's something you can just remember me for, that center your life around God, in your careers, in your businesses, in everything, make sure that your life is centered around God. Now, I close it as a pastor. There's a story about a village, friends, where there was an old man who had a bus, and the old man had an old bus. So, the story says one day, the old man's bus could not work anymore. It was in a village, and it was the only bus, the only mode of transport for the people in that village. So, the old man was requested by the community, don't give up on the bus, for we have no transport to get to the town, where people can get the necessities of what they need and everything they need. So the old man fixed the bus in a way that he could and prepared to get the people of the community inside the bus to take them to town. The old man had a grandson. The, the young man was there. And the old man said, today you come to me to work. You come with me to work. And they, got, they got on the bus and they were about to travel. But remember, the bus was old, and the bus was driven by an old man. As the journey went on, the old man was driving at a high speed. The brakes of the bus could not function. So the bus was full of people, and the bus had no brakes that were functioning. The old man tried to control the bus, but the bus was going out of the road. And everyone was terrified for their lives. For it seems like this bus would not make it to our destination alive. So they tried to 
they tried to, the, the bus driver tried to hold on to the steering wheel and, and control the bus. But people's heads were hitting windows and there was chaos in the bus. And everyone was crying for their lives. For no one knew what tomorrow holds. And so, but the, as they were crying and shouting, they realized the grandson of the old man was running around the bus. When everyone was panicking and everyone was worried about their lives, the young boy was having a good time. The old man controlled the bus and somehow, somehow, the bus reached its destination. And as the old man stopped the bus, everyone started to clap hands and ululate. But one asked and said, but could we all see that when all of us were crying, the boy was having a good time. And they rushed to the young man and they said, why were you having fun when all of us were terrified? And listen to the response of the young man. When you were crying, I was comforted by one fact, that I know the bus driver. The bus driver is my grandfather. And therefore, if he drives the bus, the bus would make it safe to its destination. And I'm here to say to all of us, I don't know how difficult life is. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know the pain you feel. At the moment, all of us here have pain of the passing away of this young lady. But hear the words of the preacher, man. I know the bus driver. And this bus will reach safely to its destination. Hold on. Keep the faith. Don't give up. We will lose many around us. But don't give up. Hold on to the faith. For the bus driver is still in control of this journey. God is still in control, friends. God is still in charge. And it's my message to each and every one of us here. That don't worry. God is still in control. And he's still seated on his throne. We will not understand these things. But we will understand in the by and by. May God bless you all and keep you safe. May he shine his countenance upon you. May he bless your families. And may he put a hedge over you and your children. And may he strengthen you, mama, as you go on this journey. You might feel alone, but hear the words of the preacher. You are not alone. God is with you. Hold on, friends. Hold on. This is not the end. God is still in control. May God bless you and keep you safe. May he shine his countenance upon you. May he bless you and keep you safe. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we sing a song and we can pray? Maybe we can stand as we do our benediction. Jehovah, we come before your throne of grace in the office of prayer. We are asking that you show mercy on us. Many of us, we think that we still have tomorrow to live. But we ask, Father, that in the many days that are still left in our lives, may we please live it centered around you. We pray for the mother of Naledi. It is my prayer that you comfort and give her strength. It's never easy for a mother to lose a child, the one and only child. 
when all of us have departed away from her, it is my prayer that you meet her at a point of need. May she never lack anything. And Father, when she is lonely, please, Lord, come close to her. She goes back to Botswana to bury her one and only daughter, give her strength. It is my prayer, Father, that you also continue to comfort the friends and give them strength. It is never easy to take care of someone. It leaves you traumatized. For those who took part, it is my prayer that, Father, you liberate them emotionally, socially. I also pour a blessing on each and every one of us that is here. Protect us. Protect our health. Protect our careers. Protect our businesses. Protect our families. The devil is fighting. I pray, Jehovah, that, Lord, may you also continue to lead the team as they prepare to go and bear in a lady in Botswana, as far as it is. I pray that you lead the way and give them strength. I pray, Jehovah, that each and every one of us here, particularly those who are heartbroken, pour your Holy Spirit upon us so that we are comforted. I pray, Jehovah, that as we get into our cars to go back home, may you protect us on the road. Protect your people. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to uh, Muruti. I'm not even going to climb onto the podium. Just maybe one or two quick announcements. For those that are perhaps not aware, the funeral is going to be on Sunday, the 19th of December in uh, Palapia, Botswana. Uh, those that perhaps would like assistance with um, ideas for accommodations and op accommodation and options, Please feel free to have a chat uh, with us when we when we exit. We'll be more than happy to to assist you with that. And lastly, as we we file out, please uh, you don't need to go via KFC or Uber Eats. Um, we have prepared uh, refreshments outside, so you can you can grab a little something, and at least uh, as you go home, at that part you know that it is taken uh, care of. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, we really appreciate you for coming out and showing your, your support. Have a good evening and drive safe. <laughs>